What is going on, everybody? Jamie Shaw here from the Absolute Basketball Experience. And today's guest, we are bringing you VCU head coach Mike Rhodes as he talks going from his D3 coaching position at Randolph Making all the way to becoming the VCU coach. Uh, his, his, his path is great. The stories that he has are unbelievable. And it's a must listen to for anybody young in the profession, VCU fans, uh, of the hard work it took to get there. Uh, and anybody, really, great story. Oh, great, great stuff. Uh, very excited for you guys to listen to it. But before we do, we ask the normal, please go ahead and subscribe to this channel. Thumbs up, give it the like button, and comment below what your favorite part of the story was. We want to hear from you uh, what your favorite part that Rhodes talked about was. Uh, without further ado, here is VCU head coach Mike Rhodes on the Absolute Basketball Experience with Jamie Shaw. After graduating from Lebanon in 95, you jumped on staff at Randolph-Macon in 96, and, you know, after that, you took over that program for a 10-year stint as the head coach. You know, as a head coach under the age of 30 when you began, what was the biggest adjustment that you made, I guess, moving down that chair to, to running the program? Well, the, a couple of things. You know, my three years working for Hal Nunley and Randolph Megan was an apprenticeship. It was just he and I, and I did everything you could think of in the program. I, I was in charge of the budget, but 10 minutes later, I'm washing uniforms. I'm filling up the white van because I'm driving the van, but I also uh, was in charge of scouting reports. Uh, I oversaw recruiting. I did everything with recruiting, uh, and I, I would be on campus with recruits by myself at 23, 24, 25 years old without the head coach. So I did everything, but I just had such a great um, person in, how, in Coach Nunley to, to help me through it all. It was, it was unbelievable. It was a great experience. So when I became the head coach at 25, coached my first game at 26, just for the first time as the head coach, you're going to go through things you're just not ready for. Uh, it's just how it goes. Dealing with a player, dealing with parents, um, dealing with officials. Uh, when the schedule, working work the gym schedule out with other coaches, you're like I can make a list of 20 things, you just got to go through it the first time to gain experience and to gain value out of it. So that's, that, that's the part I always tell young coaches, when you become a head coach, it's going to hit you right in the face quick and you're going to deal with it. If you're a competitive person, you're going to find a way to deal with it. I always say one thing I learned very quickly in my first couple years as a head coach, never be too high, never be too low. When you're on the mountaintop, you think you're, you think you're all that and gravy, man. Uh, and you, you think, oh, I'm going to be up here forever. You get knocked off. Yeah. And uh, you learn, you become humble. And then when you're down in the valley and you, have a, you lose a recruit or a player leaves your program or, or you have a really tough loss and something doesn't go your way, you're down there and you can't stay that. You got to get up. You got to wipe yourself up and, and go to work and, and figure it out. I, I always say, like, you got to have that even keel. And I think one reason why this is my 24th year now that I am where I'm at is I learned that pretty quick because I was a head coach at 25 and I had some great mentors that helped me too. So those are the biggest things. I think when you're a young head coach, you got to, you just got to go through it yeah. and then survive it and realize not too high, not too low. And then kind of furthering that a little bit during your 10 year, 10 seasons at Randolph Macon, you amassed 197 wins, 72% win percentage. You made it to four, uh, NCAA Division Three tournaments and stuff. How did you grow the most from taking over at 25 to when to when you left in 2009? Oh, uh, tremendously. Um, you know, the the I, I think one of the things I always say, and I say to a lot of young coaches, the things that you would battle for at 25, 26, 27, because you just don't know. Uh, you might not battle for them uh, at 33, 34, 35. And when I say that, it's more. Uh, with you know administration uh admissions different things like that that you find a different path to try to get what you want uh sometimes uh it's, it's less vinegar you know what i mean and and, oh, yeah. and so I, I say that you just you find a balance of dealing with people you find the balance of how you're going to go about it uh, the one thing that i thought i learned the most was trying not to repeat my the same mistakes mm -hmm. um in recruiting in division three that's really helped me at this level um, you know, get ability. Uh, there's kids in division three, man. I want him so bad. I want, I have no chance at him. That's okay to say that to move on to get the guy that's going to help you win the league. Yeah. Cause that guy you really want and you know, you can't get, he's never going to help you win the league. Go find the guy that's going to help you win the league. And 
I just learned that the get ability part was probably the biggest thing with experience. You learn that you take a couple on the chin, but you got to learn that stuff. I think that's important for young coaches to understand that, that the reality of your situation and where you're at, you got to maximize it. And I thought we did that uh, my 10 years at Randolph Macon and we had a lot of fun doing it. Absolutely. And, and then in 2009, after your 10 years, Shaka came calling. Uh, at the time, he was the hottest name, hottest name in basketball, all that kind of stuff. What was it like for you, you know, being a D3 coach at Randolph Macon and stuff, having yeah. Shaka Smart call you and court you to be on his, on his staff? Well, honestly, it was the other way around. I, I knew Shock a little bit from on the road. He was good friends with Sean McAloon, uh, who's now at IMG. Sean was my, my first assistant at Randolph Macon. And they worked some camps together and, and why Sean worked for me. And I got to know Shaka that way and spent some time with him. So we just, you know, cordially knew each other. You know, I, I got the job at 25 at Randolph Macon. When I was 35, I had the itch to try to coach at a higher level. Uh, I, I wanted to be in that, uh, that arena. And, and uh, the opportunities I had to do that were very slim or just not situations where I felt like I wanted to do. And, because I had a great job at Randolph Macon. Uh, but at 35, I was like, if I don't try this now, I probably won't try it at 45. So when Chaka got the VCU job, I reached out to him and um, we had a, a, a third party reach out to him and say, well, you have any interest in, in Mike Rhodes? He's like, he would never leave Randolph Macon. And at that time I had the itch and mm. I thought uh, I would love to give division one. I, I can always go back to D3. I felt, felt like that, but let, let, let's try this this life. And, and you know, what was great about it was I wanted to go work for somebody that I believed in, that I knew was a great person to be around, was going to do things the right way. And from day one, uh, I mean, it was totally right. Uh, I had so much fun. I got a sort of a refresh in coaching and, and a whole different role. It was awesome. I think it made me a better coach, made me a better person. Um, I was dealing with a different kid that we had at Randolph Macon that we had at VCU, and that was refreshing. I loved it. And being on the floor all summer long with the guys and in the fall where you can in Division Three, you know, that, got, that just – that really drove me. And uh, we had a lot of fun. Will Wade, Mike Jones, Jeremy Ballard, Jamie and Christian, Mike Morell. I mean, we had a great staff, and we had a lot of fun. And, and we won a lot of games, which always helps. Yeah, absolutely. And, and those guys you mentioned, they're all part of the kind of the Shaka tree that's so yeah. well known and everything. Uh, what is it about Shaka Smart that kind of grooms his guys to have such great success going on to be in head coaches? Well, I think this, like, number one, uh, people have asked me that question for years now, and I've, I, I've answered it different ways. But, uh, you know, recently I, I really thought about it and taught the style of play, I think, is something that everyone was attracted to or athletic directors are attracted to uh, that it puts people in seats. It's a fun way for recruiting success. Um, people talk about it, people try to emulate it. So I think the, the style and the, the approach and the uh, culture that we created, Coach Smart created, and we all were a part of it and, and wanted to do that. I, I think people were attracted to that, that made hiring decisions. The other side of it, I, I think Shocker hired good people. And, uh, and I think people saw that the way we had relationships with our players, the positive mm -hmm. enthusiasm that we had. And I think, I think that, it, that was attractive to, to people in their hiring positions. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, and then after your success that you had at, at VCU and everything, uh, you decided to take the job at Rice, which is a rebuild job. Yeah. 12 and 49 the previous two years before you came on board. What was it about Rice that kind of attracted you to go that route? Well, to, before I answer that, it's rewind. I, I had some opportunities. I was a finalist for a number of jobs. Mm -hmm. I was everybody's bridesmaid. And I, I was in a couple of positions where we thought we were get, I was getting a job. And at the, la, you know, the 11th hour, things changed, which happens. And, yeah. uh, but it never... I was never defeated. Um, I woke up the next day and I had an awesome job working for Shaka. I loved it. And uh, I felt that, you know, I was making an impact in the program. But the, athletic, the athletic director, Joe Carlgaard, he really came after me at Rice. And he wanted to make, you know, make a move with the basketball program at Rice. And 
a, a guy that, you know, I was number one on his list and, and he and a couple other people have really approached me and said, here's what we're going to do with it. And you know what, I, I, if I'm going to bet on anyone, I'm betting on me just like you would in, in what you do. And I said, let's do it. And we made it an adventure. My wife and I with our three kids moving across the country. There was a lot of unknown, but from day one, we just said, we're going to go to work. Mm -hmm. We're going to hire a great staff. We're going to have a lot of fun doing this. We're going to invest in people. And I, it's not going to, Rice is not a place you can just create it overnight uh, with the academic standards, the type of school it is, the way they do things. But that was okay. I was willing to to build it and and, and uh, I loved it there. We had a blast. Houston was a cool place to live. I really appreciated how my athletic director and and and, and his uh, peers really supported us. Um, and then my our third year, we we got it really got it going, and yeah. we, we were beating people and competing against people, and you know made made a lot of noise that way. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, to kind of key in on that third year, you know, as we said, twelve and forty nine the previous two years before you. By year three, you know, you're, you're 23 and 12. Yeah. What would you say the key to that rebuild kind of was, you know, in, in those three seasons? Well, number one was you got to recruit, right? <laughs> good players make good coaches. So we made sure before that was, was I, I want to hire, I, I, I want to hire my staff. I want to hire a very good staff, mm -hmm. guys that believe in what I believe in, Guys that are going to be relentless workers, have great relationships, and be fun to be around. And I think that 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 seeps into the players and who you're recruiting and, and the culture that we're trying to put down. And honestly, the first year was the was the biggest difference. I, I just said we're not gonna we're not gonna allow anything but our best effort. And some days we'll get results, some days we won't. But and that shocked a lot of people. That shocked other coaches at our athletic department, people on campus. It shocked some players that were returning. They, they, some wanted to do it, some didn't want to do it, but we were going to find guys that were going to compete. And no matter what, who we were playing, we were expecting to win the game. And, and, but we were going to practice and play really hard every day. So that right there, and our staff believed in that as well. And then we had a plan. You know, our plan was to build it to last, not quick fix it, build it to last. And, I really thought we were heading in a great direction. And to be honest with you, uh, VCU came calling. And if not, I probably would still be there because it was a really cool place to be. And I liked how we were doing it. Absolutely. And, and just a few short years before that, you were a successful D3 coach. Now, you know, a few short years after, you're a successful mid-major coach at Rice. What would you say the biggest adjustments or differences were in those two levels of, of success? On the, sh the short term, the short term was the, I guess there's the added pressure to succeed that mm -hmm. even though at Randolph-Macon, Randolph-Macon is a, Randolph-Macon is a better job than a lot of division one jobs mm -hmm. from the support, the type of school it is, the tradition, the emphasis on, on doing things the right way. So I had a great job there, but, but I think being in division one that they added stress or or emphasis on on succeeding and winning and trying to get to the NCAA tournament I think every coach that makes that jump's got to understand that but we all put pressure I put more pressure on myself than anybody or anything could or any fan ever will and that will never change us in the way I'm driven but I think that part of it is um I think you just uh in, in Division One, there's just more people involved. There's more eyes on you. There's more media, all that stuff. You, and you just got to you, you gotta learn to balance all that. I think that's the biggest thing. And, you know, the I said this yep, the other day. I was talking to a bunch of young coaches in a Zoom meeting. And I said the biggest adjustment I had from going to Randolph-Macon to, to VCU and even Rice was was understanding all the rules in Division One. In Division Three, the 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 rule book is much much smaller than Division One, and I would ask a lot of questions, even simple questions, to make sure we were doing things the right way. And I think sometimes at VCU, like you didn't know that. I, I'm just making sure. I'm just yeah. making sure. And at, at Rice, I did the same, and I had a lot of assistants that that came from Division One, so they knew. But that was one of my biggest adjustments: making sure you knew the rule book. Yeah. Well, it's it's better to find out via asking questions than doing it and, and figing it out. I warn everybody on the front end, I'm going to ask a lot. 
Absolutely. Um, so as part of my job, obviously, as you know, I, I travel to different colleges, go to games, cover games, practices, and all that kind of stuff. Yep. VCU's atmosphere is second to none when that thing's going. How big of an advantage is the Siegel Center and when the fan base is, is there in full effect? Oh, I think it's the, it's the best in the country. Uh, and I hear that from, from the TV people, uh, that how, how much they love doing games in the, stu- in, in the, in the stew, in, in the Siegel Center because of our fans, Ram Nation. I mean, they, what I love about our games at, at VCU, uh, we have 152 straight sellouts, consecutive sellouts. Uh, you know, after this season, it will be in the 170s. It's just, it's unbelievable. But we have our diversity of our campus, our diversity of our city, uh, that gives us an unbelievable vibe. So you'll see all types of people in the Siegel Center in black and gold cheering in our student section, in, in our season ticket section, in, 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 in our general admission section. There could be a, a, a plumber sitting next to a surgeon, sitting next to a person, a CEO that owns his own business next to a high school teacher, and they're all cheering for us. And th- that diversity in the city of Richmond and that diversity at VCU, and that shows up all the time at our home games. And then the band, the Peppas, you know, I think they're the best uh, band uh, atmosphere in, in college basketball. They get us all going, our dancers, our cheerleaders, and then the way we market the games and all that stuff, I think it's second to none. When you're a visiting team and you come in, you know you better be on your game to beat us, and I think that's a lot of fun. And, and with all of that excitement and stuff comes a very strict eye from the fan base. What are some of the pressures that you kind of have being the head coach at VCU? That, that's, that's rabid fan bases, and, and Ram Nation is one of them. But that's okay. Good. We have high expectations. Um, you know, and then, you know, the, the, there's always – there's always, uh, what, what do you call them, Monday morning quarterbacks, right? You know, everyone has an opinion and all that stuff. And you know what? They're allowed to have their opinions. Uh, to me, uh, number one, I think what's special about Ram Nation and our fans, they're very protective of our, of our players. You know, that's, there's always a couple here and there that are outliers that, that do some crazy stuff that we see. But, you know, we don't deal with that. Uh, but we have so many fans that are really protective of our players and, they're as excited that they're graduating from VCU as they are scoring 1,500 points in, or getting their names up in the rafters or making the NSA tournament. There's a lot of success going on in our program outside of the court that our fan base is really excited about as well, and I think that's really cool. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's the pressure of winning that is on our program, our coaches, and our players. Uh, if they're going to come out every night, they want us to perform at a high level. I think that's great. And, you know, a great example, Jamie, this year, we're 17 and six and everybody's going crazy talking about the seating in the NSA tournament. And then we just have a windfall of crazy things that happen to us with our toughest a 10 schedule and the bottom falls out and we lose a bunch of games and we're not in the tournament. Our fans are mad. I'm mad. That's because VCU, we want to crush it at the end of the year. So just like any fan base, you got to go through some frustrating times. Uh, but, you know, the, what, I'm, what I'm excited about is trying to build this every year like Shaka did and Will Wade did and Coach Grant Capel did and a long time, a, tr- a long tradition of VCU coaches and, pro- and teams that have done things the right way and, and won games at a high level. We're going to continue that with Ram Nation behind us. Kind of wraps everything up here. Uh, is there anything that you want to leave VCU fans, Mike Rhodes fans, anything you want to leave them with? No, no, Jamie, I appreciate everything that you and, and your, your people do for, for all these high school kids and high school programs and helping all the colleges. You, you and, and your people and your, I'm not even going to call it a business. I think it's your life. You guys have done an unbelievable job, not just in the state of North Carolina, but everywhere. Uh, you guys saved a lot of a lot of kids. You know that, and you guys helped them get opportunities that have changed their lives. That's going to change their children's lives. So don't stop fighting the good fight. Keep doing it, and you know, for everybody out there going through this pandemic, just keep pushing through. Keep finding a way. Wake up every day and see how how you can make it a great day. And and uh, we'll get back to somewhat normal soon, and then really normal down the road. And when we do, we'll all be better for it. Coach, so I, I appreciate. You. I appreciate your time. I appreciate you coming on. I can't wait to see what uh, this year brings for you and uh, the excitement and all that kind of stuff. Thank you very much.
Absolutely, guys. Thank you for tuning in. Absolute Basketball Podcast for Mike Rhodes. I'm Jamie Shaw. We'll see you next time.